Uh, the Bainite transformation, you know, about 30 years of research, can be summarized in this slide. It basically <laughs> forms as a plate of margincite, but it forms at a temperature where the carbon can escape from that plate into the austenite and precipitate there as cementite particles. But we can kill the reaction at this point. Yeah, we can stop the precipitation of cementite by adding an element like silicon, for example, or aluminium, because the cementite hates silicon or aluminium. Now, in principle, therefore, we can produce a structure which is incredibly fine. So this is just conventional uh, high temperature bainite. Uh, the scale here is a millionth of a meter, so the plates have a mean free slip distance of about a quarter of a micrometer. And the reason why they are like that is because of the atomic mechanism of transformation. There's a lot of strain, and tin plate is the best way to accommodate that strain. <coughs> Instead of having the conventional cylinder, you end up with Regions of austenite. Now, austenite is a good phase to have. It's an expensive phase in normal stainless steel because you have to add nickel. Here, we are making it extremely cheap by using the carbon that is rejected from the ferrite. And it's a very stable phase because the partition carbon has a concentration of the order of 1.28% to 1.48% inside the austenite. So, we have a beautiful microstructure which is alternating plates in three dimensions of very fine ferrite separated by very nice films of retained austenite, which has a toughness. But this would have a strength of the order of 1600 megapascals, so that really isn't sufficient to make a bearing. <coughs> in order to make this stronger, we've got to make the plate finer. And we have a, a lot of uh, theory developed over a period of 30 years, as I said, to see how we can make it finer. And one method is to reduce the transformation temperature. So the question then arises, what is the lowest transformation temperature at which I can produce beta? Well, as I said to you, we have the theory, we do the calculations, and according to this, so this is in Kelvin, so this is room temperature here, we could produce bainite at room temperature. Okay? This is the minus side cloud temperature, this is the bainite cloud temperature. If I put sufficient carbon in my material, I could get bainite at room temperature. But this isn't enough. We've got to also have some kinetics into this. And if I do produce bainite at room temperature, it would take me about 100 years. So you would be treating this like good wine, you make the steel, you leave it for 100 years, and then you will get an incredibly fine structure. But Tom said that he is impatient. <laughs> <laughs> so, so we have to do this in a reasonable amount of time, and if you go towards one weight percent of carbon, then we have a reasonable amount of time of 10 days at a pizza oven temperature. Now, you might not think that 10 days is reasonable, but let me come back to that. So, we designed uh, a steel completely theoretically. This is carbon, this is silicon to stop the cementite. And the other elements are needed in order to stop other transformations from interfering. And I'll come back to this particular element later on, because we can't purify steel sufficiently to kill the phosphorus. So, we've got to add another element which gathers the phosphorus, which stops it from doing harm at austenite <coughs> grain boundaries. It has a beautifully simple structure with just two phases, both of which are not in themselves hard. So austenite is not particularly strong, and ferrite is not particularly strong, but if you have an intimate mixture, that, that can be very strong. So here's an optical micrograph of the structure. It doesn't look I mean, it's beautiful to me, but it doesn't look anything special, right? So I want you to get ready and take a deep breath. So the next micrograph I'll show you is amazing. It's a transmission electron micrograph. So are you ready? <laughs> okay. <coughs> this is the amazing structure that we discovered, where this is a scale uh, which is in angstroms, but 
just to give you an idea, this is a carbon nanotube, okay, which has made a lot of noise recently. Uh, these are crystals of vainite, which are finer than carbon nanotubes, and this is the austenite, which is dispersed between them. This material has the highest density of interfaces that has ever been produced in a bulk material. I'll, I'll show you what bulk means. It doesn't mean that you take a small amount of material and you bash it to produce a fine structure. So it's an exciting material. It's very, very strong. And it can be produced in huge quantities. So, so far, something of the order of 300 tons has been produced by Tata Steel. And it can be produced in different forms. Uh, these are, this is a project we were working with, Rolls-Royce, to make shaft for our engines. So these are very big. And we can produce the structure uniformly. It is ostentized as usual, okay? You then take it out of the high temperature furnace and you put it into a salt bath which will uh, be at 200 degrees centigrade and you hold it there for long enough to produce the structure. So let me just summarize. This is our structure. It's very strong. It has uniform ductility. So if you look at the standard bearing field, you have to do the Tesla test very carefully to detect plastic. Here we can get between 7 and 30 percent of plasticity. It doesn't require deformation to produce this structure. It doesn't require rapid heat treatment, which is a big advantage if you look at things like distortion. Okay. And therefore, you're not left with a system of stresses inside the material before you actually do anything with it. And uh, it's uh, very cheap. Okay. There's no new technology required to produce this. And it's uniform in large sections. And this is not all the results we have, but this is work done by Chris Amy, who is somewhere in the audience, and Pedro Rivera, where we can show that the distortion due to the phase transformation itself, if when you do the heat treatment, if you have a material in which there's a temperature gradient and transformation will start first, in one region and then in another region, and that develops a system of stresses. But if you can start the transformation uniformly everywhere, then basically you have very little distortion. Of course, there are many, many mechanisms of distortion, but this particular mechanism is more or less eliminated. Okay. The structure is uniform <coughs> in large dimensions. Ignore this one, I can't explain it. Okay, this particular <laughs> point. But it's, 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 it's hard. And you can engineer the treatment for a variety of combinations of properties. So it is a versatile concept. Um, I don't have the very latest fatigue data, the rolling complex fatigue data, but those experiments have been done, and I haven't heard any scream. So things are going well, the fatigue properties are very good, and I'll also show you that I have confidence in the structure for other reasons in terms of rolling contact fatigue. The material already has sold as armor, and the armor is actually the best armor that exists so this is conventional armor, this is titanium, alumina, and this is now the super bayonet. So alumina can't take many shots for obvious reasons, okay? And this is corrected for density because this is a ballistic mass efficiency. It's the mass of ordinary armor to defeat a given threat or the mass of a test material to defeat the same threat. So it outperforms normal armor, even if it's made out of titanium. Okay, now let me explain to you why I have confidence and why actually I have impatience with SKF yeah. uh, in developing this concept further. So, rail steels are conventionally based on the pearlite structure. So, almost all rail steels are pearlitic in nature, and that pearlite has served us very well, and the properties have improved by making the spacing between the lamina finer and finer. But that doesn't actually alter the toughness because it's the size of that cabbage which determines toughness. This new 
structure. Uh, maybe it has the radiant ferrite and the pain osmanite. This is a, the superbainite, this is a lower strength because you don't need the strength of bearings being raised. We did a very, very simple calculation, something like 15 or 20 years ago. And Tata Steel chorus that took it up and immediately made graves out of this material, which had remarkable performance. Okay, so this is rolling contact fatigue, full scale tests done at an institute in Poland, where this is a normal ray. Okay, and this is a, a martensitic hardened ray, and this is the new structure without any carbides at all. So it completely outperforms anything on rolling contact fatigue. Of course, rolling contact fatigue in a ray scenario is different from rolling contact fatigue in uh, uh, bearing because there's also a certain amount of sliding involved. In terms of wear, and this is this you might be surprised, it's minimal wear compared with politic or martensitic, and not only that, but it cuts down the wear on the wheel. It's the only material which cuts down the wear on the wheel. Now, why does it work? Well, it is, of course, hard, but it has ductility. Okay? So there is plasticity involved in the austenite. And therefore, you don't get wear that ring forming very easily. So if, you, if some of you have traveled by the Channel Tunnel today, okay, you have actually gone on my rails through that tunnel. And I'm sure you had a smooth ride. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> now, let me just make one further point on these rails. When we scaled up the size of the rail, we came up against problems. So after making the rail, the rail was simply fractured while in storage. And when we looked at the fractured surface, it was pretty obvious why this was happening. The austenite grade surfaces were embrittled by phosphorus, which you cannot easily remove. So at one point, we were going to abandon the large section rails. And the reason why this is particularly important in strong steels is that in softer steels, you have phases like ferrite and perlite which grow across the austenite grain boundaries and destroy those boundaries. So there's no room left for the segregation of phosphorus to the austenite grain boundaries. But with strong steels where we generate martensite or bainite, they, this involves a deformation to change the crystal structure. And that deformation is like a military transformation. The atoms move in a systematic way. That means they cannot cross grain boundaries. Okay. So you are left with the loose packing of the prior axiomatic grain boundaries in the final structure, and that means that you can get segregation of impurities at those locations much more easily than in the softer steels. And then you get failure at the austenite grain boundaries. Now, we can't really remove phosphorus easily. It's expensive to do, but if you add molybdenum, this is a very, very well known effect from 60 years ago, then that effectively kills the effect of phosphorus. And then, um, then you can uh, get better toughness and a lack of failure from the austenite grain boundary. So we're not, probably not going to be able to reduce the phosphorus concentration much in bearing steels, but I think I have seen intergranular failure in bearing steels, which means that we need to strengthen the austenite grain boundaries. Once you get fine protect at the austenite grain boundaries, you will get damage because of the pulsating stress and white matter, etc. Et so the role of carbides and of austenite grain boundaries becomes important when we make clean steels with fewer inclusions and so forth. Okay, now let's just uh, think about uh, fatigue. Uh, Statius is in the audience somewhere, and you know some of his work is now a standard piece of technology in uh, bearing steels, where you use equations to predict, you know, that 10% of the bearings are going to fail after a certain number of revolutions. Now, when I actually explain to Ivan Kerrigan what L10 means, L10 means the life of the number of revolutions for 10% failure, he said, no, it doesn't mean that. 
it means the number of revolutions where 90% are successful variables. Okay. Do you remember that? Yeah. <laughs> okay. So, positive way of thinking. So, these two characters came up with the original model for lighting bearings. I'm also going to describe some of uh, Pedro's work here. And then I want to, this is work that I want to do, neural networks. So, the original work comes from viral statistics. So, viral statistics were developed to deal with brittle solids. So if you make a brittle solid larger, then it cracks at a smaller stress. It's simply because the probability of finding a defect becomes higher in a larger object. And that is why you, know, you can bend a glass fiber, but you can't bend a chunk of steel, a uh, chunk of uh, glass without breaking it. But Weibull statistics uh, doesn't really solve the lighting problem for a bearing because it says, you know, if I have a certain uh, stress and a certain size, it will break completely, okay? So what they did was introduce some bearing concepts that looked actually the stress occurs at a certain depth below the surface in a bearing. So the volume that we consider has to be related to the Hertzian distribution of stress. And then by making those substitutions, came up with a simple equation that the light for 90% successful bearing is related to two parameters here. This is a, a bearing design parameter and this is a loading parameter. And this equation was very, very successful in giving the light in theory for bearings and then starting to modify this that look, we might have a fatigue limit, which means that if I have a stress below a certain level, it's not going to do any damage. And it has had many modifications by these factors because, you know, when they produce clean steel, they have to put in a factor for clean steel and so forth. So as a mechanism for explaining their life to other people, it's a very good system and it's used in standards and you can see SKF catalogs which give values of factors, etc., etc. But it's based on experimental measurements, okay? That means you have to do bearing tests in order to derive the parameters. What we are trying to do, and this is Pedro's work, is use dislocation theory. So dislocation theory has been very well developed. And you can work out the creation of dislocations, the annihilation of dislocations, everything contributing to the damage process. And if you assume, for example, that the pile of dislocations is actually creating residual stresses inside your material, then you make a big assumption that that's related to the residual stresses that you develop during service in a bearing. So by doing that, you know, uh, Pedro himself does not take this correlation very seriously, but it's interesting that the numbers are roughly of the right order. This is its calculation of the residual stress level that develops below the surface during service as a function of uh, the number of revelations, and these are data from Boscan, uh, one of the Gascard classics. Yep. Now, there's a lot of work that remains to be done, and he's trying to develop a thermodynamic framework which allows many different dissipations to be put into one single framework. Long way to go, but we are trying. Now, the advantage of this, even if it is not realistic to compare the scales of dislocations and the long-range stresses that develop, is that we have structure in the equations. Okay? If we have structure in the equations, by structure I mean microstructure. If we have microstructure, and the equations suggest that this particular item needs modification, you know, for example, the rate at which carbides dissolve during deformation, if you assume a certain value which will lead to the dissolution of the carbides, we can modify that okay, to make the carbides more stable or less stable or whatever. <coughs> but with a theory like this, even though it is very unlikely that it can be used for lighting, okay, because it's, it doesn't have sufficient complexity, then you can actually use it in the design of new variables. Now, 
this is a, another area which comes from collaboration within the university. So my colleague David Mackay in the Cavendish Laboratory developed the most fantastic Bayesian framework for neural networks. And the movie that you see over there is just a very simple explanation of what a neural network is. It's a very flexible mathematical function. Okay? If it's very flexible, then you can fit it to any complicated problem, whether it involves 10 variables, 100 variables, 1,000 variables. So we did, we created a model for fatigue track growth. And you know, people regard neural networks as black boxes, but if you look, if you do a search for neural networks in material science on Google, you'll come across my website as the top page, okay? Where you can see that we have created new physics, we have created new materials using mathematically explicit neural networks in a Bayesian framework. So what we did is SKF would not give us the data when we were doing this work, yeah? So that's a criticism. <laughs> So what we did is we collected catalogs of reported fatigue track properties for a vast range of fields, nothing to do with bearing fields. Okay? Because you know fields are fields and we should be able to pull data and explain data in other systems. We had a track cross model. And you know this model is amazing. We, all you need to know is these inputs. We can even with the same inputs predict what happens in titanium alloys, nickel basic super alloys, and aluminum alloys without any modification to the model. And this is an example of our calculations. These are uncertainties, not verified. And these are data from the classic bearing field, 5 to 1, 0, 0, for mode 2 cracking and bending. Okay, now mode 2 tests are very difficult to do. What this tells you is that you don't need to do the test. Yeah, the prediction here is good, the uncertainties are small. Now, if the uncertainties are large, that is where you need to do the testing. Okay. And in principle, if you design a new steel, the first thing you should do is view the model like this to do the calculation and see whether we are going to get reasonable values for properties. And trust me, this method captures physics. Okay. Captures physics, and you can see the physics highly non-linear problems. So this is something that I want to do. <coughs> okay, so just to summarize. Uh, these are the things which uh, are happening. Okay, how I treat a little field. Hydrogen resistance field. Uh, I would like to see work on the strengthening of the osmite grain boundaries. And these are models that are being worked on. Pedro is doing a lot of work on the dislocation. Pedro and uh, Ji Hun Tang. And this theory is there now. And we want to apply it a bit more. First of all, to improve the spiritization process that exists right now. And then, of course, if we create a new steel, we'll need to look at that. OK. In universities, you know, I explain to you that the Bainite work is based over a very large number of years. Yeah, the super Bainite would not have been possible without that fundamental work. So there is absolutely no question that we have to focus on long-term research. And just to give you an example, uh, I explained that this steel will take 100 years to form Bainite. But wouldn't it be exciting to see how fine that Bainite was? Okay. So we made that steel. Okay, here, here it is. And it will take, according to the calculations, it will take 100 years to transform. And that steel was made in 2004, so we expect the results. In 2104. So, you know, what you should do is tell your children and your grandchildren the story. So that they can go and examine the steel in the future and see whether we have achieved the results. But, it is also true that I would like to see products coming out of this, okay? So obviously, uh, we need to plan in the long term, but also in the short term. And one of the criticisms I have is that we need to look at the big picture. We mustn't develop a steel based simply on hardenability or cleanliness or spiralization or rolling point activity like that. All the aspects must be 
covered at an early stage so that we are not going to examine new steel every two years because some criteria have not been satisfied. We need to set up a program of work which is bigger involvement of SKF scale, yep. where we look at the big picture and take the two bay nine into service faster. Now, this is the very first meeting that we had where everyone was happy and the agreement was more or less signed. <laughs> and there are only two famous people here, there's me and Rachel Hoffman who's sitting right at the back. You know, good students always sit in the front. <laughs> but we are dominated here by SKF staff. Let me show you now the situation today. There's an awful lot of young and fresh faces here, and some which are not so young or fresh, but have very good friends. <laughs> so all of these people are involved in creating the next adventure in various fields, all of them. So we have a seamless interaction with SKF. We don't agree with each other on everything. We have heated arguments and discussions. But you know, without that, we need to be fun. So I will stop there, and we can, uh, we can all answer questions. Well, thank you very much indeed, Harry. I hope, uh, as Harry says, trust me, uh, you should trust us uh, that um, global leader of the company meets global leader of the professor to do our best with best collaboration. Uh, and I think both sides, if I can put it that way, are happy to take questions, uh, if you have any, on how to cook your pizza better or whatever. Mm -hmm. So we've got microphones. Yeah, you have to bring light in one direction. This material direction is sensitive. No, no, no. Uh, if you look at the optical micrograph, which I, I show deliberately, um, you see, the trouble with uh, structures which are very fine is that you have to look at a very narrow region. This is the optical micro the micrograph. This is an isotropic material. But when you focus on a very small region, you see that. Uh, Thank you. Oh, yes. Can we have one right at the back? I was just to comment on your rather remarkable super day I think it's going to break through a physical mental um, You mentioned the 200 degrees C transformation. You can really tell us how long it might take in a commercial uh, product. Also, looking at the structure, it seemed to be indicating phosphonite and black ferrite. But was that actually a lower bainite? And did it bear the normal orientation of those particular bones? Very good question. So it's not low bainite in the sense that we have no carbide precipitation at all. And the time taken for this particular structure that I illustrated is 10 days. Now, 10 days is not a long time at 200 degrees centigrade because it's a cheap heat treatment and it avoids all the distortion problems because the transformation doesn't start for a couple of days. However, we can speed this up if, if the demand is there. For example, if we increase the free energy change between austenite and ferrite by adding cobalt, for you know, something like one and a half weight percent cobalt, the reaction is faster, we can do it in two days or hours. Okay? But my recommendation, and this is what we did in the work with Rolls Royce as well, my recommendation is we don't do that because there are big advantages in doing really it slowly, and I cannot see a difficulty. You know, you just build a big oven and leave things in there for 10 days and if the production line, you just take them out systematically. Orientation relationships, there's nothing new. It's the same orientation that you find in ordinary gray metal, which is, uh, some people call it virtual sax type orientation relationships. Now we have another question here. Yeah, which is on steel. It's a non central question. Uh, which I've never asked. Which object is uh, either Tom or Alan? Um, to equip the world with SKF knowledge is a, a fantastic ambition. Um, it's one I've 
first heard when I first moved to Gothenburg about three years ago. Um, and I think in a context for a reason like this, it's something that feels very natural. My question would be, how do you go about making 44,000 people worldwide uh, feel that ambition and embody it when they interact with the outside world? Gosh, uh, that's a good question. Um, I think our, if it's about communication community, and we have a, we have a large program at the moment uh, of what we call business excellence. Uh, business excellence is a, is a derivative of our manufacturing excellence program where we've been looking to apply uh, essentially to the production system, taking the technology into our manufacturing, and that's been very successful for us. Uh, and we're looking to apply those kind of principles right across all areas of our business. And, and, and so innovation excellence is something that we are, we are uh, working on now and looking very heavily. And uh, I think within our innovation excellence program, we can get that message through to our engineering community and to the applications engineering community uh, working with the So I think we've got a, we've got a communication mechanism to do that. Um, I think you know, if you if you ask engineers in, in SKF, do they do they understand what the knowledge engineering company means and do they promote knowledge engineering? I think you find most of them are already doing that. I think you find quite a strong commitment within SKF to say we're not all of us tonight, we're going to have to pass that I think the you hit on what I think is one of the major challenges for any organization. And one of the things we say many times in SKF is if SKF only knew what SKF knows, we would be at a meeting. <laughs> and the issue there is there is knowledge in people, there is knowledge in, in organisations, and it's how to get that knowledge to the fingertips of all our people who are interfacing with the customers. I think we're doing a lot more better today than we did five years ago, but we still have a long way to go to make that knowledge transparent, available, and to the people who need it in the job, in the factories, in the job, in the offices, in the job with the customer. One of the things we push hard in SKF is that we must be a very customer-centric organization. Whatever we do and how we do things, it should start for the customer, be for the customer. And if, it, if, if there's activities we're doing, it's going to add value to the customers, we should not be doing it. In these activities. There's some activities we have to do which really don't act out to the customer, but we have to do them through the corporation. Then you can do as efficiently as possible. But we must focus on the customer and how you bring that knowledge to the customer, how you bring that information to the customer, and how you treat the right business for the customer there. I'd say we're well on our way, but we have a long way to go to really make sure that everyone in this case knows what this case really knows in the world. Thank you. Can I take a question here from Tony Kelly? I wanted also to ask as a general question, and just to uh, Mr. Johnston and Professor Deesha uh, and to Crown and Bid. I mean, it centers on the Vice Chancellor's remarks about um, and how the statement of the Vice Chancellor read out about research with an industrial partner can be more uh, or fruitful or just as fruitful or more fruitful than just working for the S DPSRC. And I agree with that. And I wanted you to comment on the following. I think the reason is that if you're working with industry the way you are working, then as the academics produce a result, it is looked at by people who have a special interest themselves in that result. And because of that, there's a sort of uh, competitive, but also very um, uh, um, exciting and dynamic and fruitful interaction. Now, unfortunately, since the...